It's, uh, it's been wonderful to be here again and to see so many of you again and to meet some of you for the first time. I'm grateful for Karen for rearranging the schedule. Uh, we had a very painful death of a uh, young adult man in our church yesterday. I want to be there for the family this afternoon. So I'll be leaving after my second address. So I thank you, friend. You're, you're going to pray for me and for the family. Thank you for that. Well, let's go back to 2 Timothy. I want to move on to chapter 2. And it is a book that has a lot of well-known verses. Uh, but more than that, it's, it's got a great message on the whole. I want to read verses 3 to 7. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 to 7. Listen now to the word of the Lord. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuit since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crop. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word, which is life and light. Bless us now. Give us ears to hear, hearts to believe and obey. In Jesus' name, amen. I was converted at age 30 to Christ in a church that was well known for its exceptional and very long-serving ministers. I'm actually, I'm the 12th senior minister of our church. I've been there 17 years, and I'm number two on the longevity list. I'm three years from becoming numero uno. <laughs> and, uh, and they're like, wow, that's amazing. I'm like, I- I'd be like number six at 10th Presbyterian Church, maybe not even that high. The longest-serving minister of 10th Presbyterian Church was the great Henry Augustus Boardman, its second pastor, uh, Ashbel Green's numero one, no, great protege, uh, and he served there for 44 years. I remember being told this story, and, and it went like this. He served for 44 years, but there was a two-year period around the 30-year mark where his health was so broken that he had to take a hiatus. Now, I heard that, and at the time, I was a, I was a combat officer in the Army, and I thought to myself, I mean, what about being a clergyman could possibly <laughs> break someone's health? <laughs> And I have spent the last 25 years getting an education (laughs) on that subject. I assure you that. Not only do I understand firsthand how exhausting and demanding service to the Lord is, I've learned, interestingly, that the Bible compares a zealous minister precisely to a soldier who's suffering hardship. Now, so far in 2 Timothy, Paul's been urging his protege to courage in the face of opposition, faithfulness and maintaining sound doctrine. And starting in verse 3 of chapter 2, he adds a third necessity. A servant of Christ must embrace hard, must embrace hard work and suffering in the cause of the gospel. In, in making this point, he turns to three of the most demanding occupations one can do, a soldier, an athlete, and a farmer. According to Philip Towner, each of these examples links disciplined, diligent performance towards obtaining a goal. Now, critics of Paul's theology uh, often complain that if you believe in sovereign grace and predestination and those sorts of things, you won't believe in effort. Well, Paul himself seems not to have gotten that memo. Uh, The premise of his instruction to Timothy, in fact, is that hard work, discipline, and a willingness to suffer are necessary components of gospel work. Well, let's look at the first example of the suffering soldier. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Now, Paul would have had a lot of acquaintance with Roman soldiers, particularly those who were guarding the various prisons in which he found himself, undoubtedly at the time he was writing this. And uh, military allusions are interspersed in his writings. You think of particularly the teaching on spiritual warfare put on the whole armor of God. Patrick Fairborn points out every believer, and preeminently every believer who's a servant of the gospel, is a soldier of Jesus Christ enlisted under him as the captain of salvation, contending against the powers of evil. I, I know how much, how tangibly that is true for all of you. Now, when Paul thinks of ministers as soldiers, he has in mind particularly the hardships that are just part and parcel of military service, especially when soldiers are deployed uh, in active service in the field. It's just normal that they're in harsh conditions. They're in demanding tasks. Uh, the uh, people said, did you, uh, did you sometimes not shower in the field? I once spent 37 days without showering. Or, and you go, but you surely you changed your underwear. I'm not aware of having done so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, 
it was not the kind of situation where one erected a bath. And uh, it's just the way it is. I remember one military base, Fort Knox, where I served. I, I commanded an armored cavalry troop there. There were three notorious hills that you would march. When you were marching out to the training areas, you first you would go up agony, and then you'd go. When you got down agony, you were at the foot of misery, and I was just, you're just like, oh man. And if the soldiers, they were brutal hills. Then about three or four kilometers later was Heartbreak Hill. And uh, it's just the way it is. It, 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 it's hardship and, and difficulty are, are what it's all about. A, a, a soldier does not expect ease and comfort, but has to harden himself to overcome suffering on a regular basis. That's the deal. And the same experiences are joined to service in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The minister is called to sacrificial service like that of his Lord. And when Paul says share in suffering, that's a single word. Uh, the prefix together with in the same verb that's used for Jesus' suffering on the cross. Uh, it's the fellow passion of the cross of Christ. Uh, soldiers are greatly aided by the shared nature of their trial. I think camaraderie, it's, it's certainly in the army, I think people who are in the army, it's certainly in my case, the thing I missed most was the camaraderie. And it's suffering that builds the camaraderie. It ought to be the same way on the mission field. Uh, you, you hear famously that missionaries can't get along, and you know, and I, it's not been my experience, and it's important that you do. And that you, you may, and I, I, I'm sure that's one of the goals of enrichment, to build friendships and a companionship and, and difficulty. Uh, and that's a privilege we have, sharing together our fellow suffering with Christ. John Stott writes, the Christian should not expect an easy time. If he or she is loyal to the gospel, they will experience opposition, hardship, ridicule, and all the rest. Now, Paul's particular focus here is on those called the vocational ministry, so basically ministers and missionaries. And for them, like soldiers, their service will involve the loss of personal freedom. There'll be fatigue from long hours. There will be anxiety over desperate pastoral cases. There will be frustration from opposition and criticism, all of which, of course, were abounding in Paul's own experience. Soldiers crawl through the mud. They stand guard in freezing rain. By the way, freezing rain is the worst. Uh, it's like that 33-degree rain. It's just in the mud under your tank tracks, and it's going inside your shirt. You're standing guard in freezing rain. They sleep uncovered in all kinds of elements. And likewise, as the casualty list reveals, serving as a gospel minister can ruin your health. Yes, it can. Now, they not only suffer, but they also die. I think of uh, 1559, John Calvin started a seminary in Geneva to train men particularly to be evangelists and church planters in his native country of France. He was very eager for the gospel to spread in France. And so many of the graduates of that academy died that it was nicknamed Calvin's School of Death. And for these valiant evangelists, the words that Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 4.10 were literally true. He said, always carrying in the body the death of Christ so that the life of Christ may be manifested through us. Now, that is the deal for anyone who's serving the Lord. I used to say, uh, for my, model, my, my philosophy of ministry was 2 Corinthians 4, 1 to 6, which is about the power of the word. My experience has caused me to embrace the whole chapter. <laughs> the part's about we minister in union with the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so a, a good soldier, Paul says, must be disciplined. Look at verse 4. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Now, these words can apply to every single Christian. We are called to offer our lives as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Paul says this is your spiritual worship, Romans 12, verse 1. But here, Paul is focusing on those ministers and missionaries called into full service. And what he says is, what you've been set apart to demands your whole attention. It demands wholehearted devotion. By this definition, the ordained ministry is intended as a full-time job which is why the New Testament calls for pastors to be paid. That's why you need to be paid. Okay, Paul says, who serves as a soldier at his own expense? If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much that we reap material things from you? 1 Corinthians 9, 7 to 11. And there are situations where churches cannot afford a full-time minister, and so you have tent makers. Paul often was that, but that is not ideal. 
The nature of the work is so significant, so important, so demanding that it deserves the full attention of God's servants. Uh, uh, churches that leave their pastors in financial distress, it's very common, they're actually impoverishing themselves. Well, Paul's description of a soldier who is not entangled in civilian pursuits should not be so pressed in a way that uh, is not balanced with other biblical teachings. Some have used this pastor to argue that missionaries should never take vacation. You should have no time off. You you should not marry. You should have no hobbies or personal interests. Only prayer and the word of God all the time. Interestingly, this was the view of the famous 20th century missionary Jim Elliott, who refused to... Uh, to date his future wife, Elizabeth Elliot, on the grounds that I'm a missionary, I'm not to have civilian pursuits. In fact, it was, he delayed their marriage by several years, which is kind of sad since he died young, you know, uh, on the basis of this verse. I, 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 I like you, I think you're swell, but I'm devoted to the Lord. Don't have time for a wife. That, that must have gone over really well at the dinner table. Uh, <laughs> but the truth is that pastors and missionaries are human beings. And they should pursue the normal supports for balanced living. I, I, one of my pet peeves is missionaries, and that's, uh, this wouldn't be you, I know, but uh, there's a whole, whole generation where the missionaries sent their kids off to boarding schools. And, and that, 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 that sowed bitter seed down the generations. And uh, if, you're a, if you're a missionary and you're a parent, you're to be devoted to your children like any other parent. Uh, and under regular situations, you should pursue marriage. You feel free to have a hobby. Feel free to cheer for the Michigan football team. You'll be <laughs> richly rewarded if you do. <laughs> and yet, the, but we get the point Paul's making. Those who are called to gospel labor should not be caught up in the world. Charles Hodge wrote that preachers are like soldiers in that the work in which they are engaged is an arduous one that calls for the exertion of all their powers. They have many enemies to overcome, both without and within. And so like a soldier on the battlefield, a pastor must be ready to spring into action regardless of the, the, the day of the week or the time of night. Uh, they are to labor, you're to labor, as if eternal destinies depend on your service, since in some measure they do. They do. John Stott notes how during World War II, the English people, they justified sacrifices by saying, well, there's a war on, you know. And for Christians, we need to realize that the relatively short years of our life involve sacrifice with a war going on. There's a war going on, you know. There's eternal consequences. Life is short, eternity is long, a phrase I often say. It's true. Now, since gospel ministers, then, are called to wartime service, let me just say this, a heavy strain is often felt by their wives. In many churches, thankfully not mine, the pastor's wife is practically seen as a full-time job involving participation in every event. She must always be there, ceaseless hospitality, un- unpaid employment as pianist or nursery coordinator. And what churches forget is that the pastor's wife is married to a man who has been called up and deployed. And she often bears a larger than normal share of the home and family duties. She holds down the fort every Sunday. If you ask my wife, what she, she doesn't complain about it. She goes, but Sunday morning's not the most fun having you not there. And it would be nice to sit with you now and again. And now and again we do, but not very often. She's holding down the fort, particularly when we were raising our children. Uh, she often has unclear expectations. Overwhelming needs are before her. And she has insecurity about where she stands in the church. I dare say on the short list of those who deserve encouragement and praise, when elders will say to me, what can we do for Sharon? I say, just say a kind word to her. Just tell her she's doing a good job. Just pray for her. And they do. Now, there's a specific goal here. Verse 4, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Now, an instructive, there's to be an instinctive obedience. By the way, this is what the army, this is what boot camp's about to drill into people the instinct of obedience. Because when you're on the battlefield, you don't have discussions. You give commands, and the, and, and the orders are obeyed. And there's a culture of obedience to command that's taken very seriously. And that's why the highest accolade that can be given to a soldier is that he or she did his duty. I was raised in a multi-generational military family, and the, uh, the thought... Son, you did your duty. I'm like, oh, that, there it is. That's what it's about. 
And you're not, you don't have to be a hero, you don't have to be a champion, you do your duty, that's a very high accolade. I remember as a former military commander, oh how I valued soldiers who did their duty from the heart. And so it is at Servants of Christ, we look forward to, I, I, the same way, I, I hope that you look forward to those blessed words, well done thou good and faithful servant. That's what we, I mean, I, 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 those words ring in my heart. For the Lord, when he returns, to say to me, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I have no higher ambition than that. And so the missionary labors on faithfully and fervently. The minister, ministers of the congregation, they are servants of Christ. We are answerable to him for our fidelity to his word and to our calling. And so whatever the demands are of church members, whatever fashions there are in the surrounding crowd, whatever readiness the people have to hear the word or not, the good soldier obeys the the orders of his commander as, as given in the Holy Scriptures. In whatever setting Christ should call us, Paul says, look at verse 9, or the 2 Corinthians 5, 9, 2 Corinthians 5, 9, we make it our aim to please him. That's his emphasis here. We, set our, we, we focus ourselves on this, to be faithful to our commander. Well, Paul's second illustration gives a different nuance to a similar theme. Look at verse 5. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Now, his point is not that Christians are competing with one another, but that we run a race that requires arduous discipline and that can only be won by observing the rules. In the athletic context of ancient Greece, which are the background for this, uh, b- before the Olympics, an athlete, every athlete would stand before the statue of Zeus and swear that he had completed the required training for at least 10 months. It wasn't just the events. There was a whole regiment of detailed training that was required in the Olympic Games. That's what Paul's picking up on. And that gives two lines of application. First, the Christian life requires discipline and disciplined training. You must read your Bibles. There must be structured times of Bible study and of prayer, regular attendance at church services, the committed exercise of spiritual gifts in Christ's service. Now, Paul's teaching belies the idea that, em- that uh, an emphasis on effort is somehow opposed to grace. No, we're, 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 the Christian life does require effort, and we're to be disciplined. We're to have a plan. It's to be the Bible's plan. Uh, today we admire professional athletes who have, oh, uh, they have they have honed the skill of shooting a free throw. If you want to be a really good free thrower, shooter, it's probably a hundred thousand shots. Start with a little boy. I've got our next door neighbor has a little boy who's a really great kid, and you see him out there in the rain shooting free throws. He's from his father played college basketball. His his aunt is a college basketball player right now. He wants to play college basketball, and he is honing the skills. He's building the muscle memory. There he is, rain and shine, and he makes, he's like 10 years old, he makes a lot of free throws. That's the way it is, and we admire that. Well, our service to Christ, likewise, deserves spiritual fitness and the passionate development of skills for teaching, for counseling, for hospitality, for whatever things are involved in you doing the work the Lord gives you. Bill Barclay puts it this way, the spare time Christian is a contradiction in terms. A Christian's whole life should be an endeavor to live out his or her faith. That's one application of it. The second idea, I think, is what Paul is particularly emphasizing, that we must play according to the rules. To see in athletics, you must learn and apply the rules of the contest. It's true. I have probably maybe an unhealthy interest in college football, my alma mater in particular. And it's fascinating the level of detail, uh, a college or pro player. If you're a defensive tackle, you spend months, in fact, right now is Michigan spring training. And what are they doing? They're learning on which play, where to place your right hand, where to place your left hand, what, at what angle should you fit. And it makes a huge amount of detail. All this detail, there's a, there's a technique for playing not only each position, but for each play and each position. And if you want to be successful, you've got to do, you got to play according to the rules. You've got to do that. And this is eminently true for Christians. A young Christian goes to college. How important it is that they, that they meet Christian friends as soon as they get there. It's vitally important. Yeah, I always tell my children, I have five children, they've all five, got to college, all five have gone to college. My two younger girls are still in college. 
our financial emancipation is a mere 24 months away. <laughs> Honey, we've got a massive pay raise, a massive pay raise coming. In fact, when we go from two to one, that'll be, a, it'll be great. But I, I always take the, that child, I take them out to dinner, like two weeks before they go to college, and I'll, I'll say, let's just talk about your, how great it's been to be your dad. And I want to talk about some of the things that just I really loved about you and, and just share that time. But they know this is coming. I go, now, we, we, I have something more than affection to show you. Here's the game plan. And my children, they, they heard this all their life. We're going to play to win. We're going to play to win. I'm a former college professor. You will sit on the front row. Yeah, the girls get second row for girls. You can they go, Daddy, we're girls. Okay, first or second row. Boys, in fact, my sons at, at college were not old. They always sat in the front row. I'm like, yes. So I'm like, you will never miss class unless you're road tripping with me to a Michigan game. That, that is true. That is, a, that is an asterisk I have exercise. Or with your mother going to Disney. That happened too. Taylor Swift does not earn the skip class. Um, and you will always show up to class with your homework done. I said, that's it. And I don't, I don't really care what grade you get. I mean, you know, I have some brilliant kids academically. I have some wonderful girls who aren't brilliantly academic. I don't really care about the grade. I care that you play, that you, that you honor the Lord. And if you're a B student, here's how you can get Bs. You will sit up front. I'm a, I know as a former professor, you know the kids in the front row, and you appreciate them. And yes, in your flip, flawed human nature, you cut them slack. <laughs> You will sit on the front row. You will always be at class. You will always have your homework done before you go to class. Feel free to have fun at college. And you will, I expect you to be involved in a very serious way in a local church. In fact, I take them to the church. I, my, I had a, my younger son just started a, a two, years, two years into a PhD program in quantum physics at Washington University in St. Louis. And I showed when we were moving him in, I showed up in the uh, lobby of the church I wanted him to go to, and I asked for the pastor. I'd, I'd like to meet the pastor, and then the woman said, sometimes you've got to use your, 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 your resources. And uh, she said, I'm sorry, the pastor's here, but he's not available. I, tell, I said, tell him Richard Phillips was in the narthex. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do that very often. <laughs> Turns out he was reading one of my commentaries at the moment. <laughs> He came right down. I said, this is my son, Jonathan. He will be attending your church. I commit him into your care. And that pastor emails me. And, uh, and uh, Jonathan's first year, he's what a wonderful boy he is. And his first year was such scientific boot camp that he, wasn't, he, was, he went to church, but he wasn't involved in the church. His second year, I said, we, 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 my wife and I drove out there and spent a weekend with him. We love him. And I said, let's make it our goal this year to be find a, a group, a Bible study. And, and he's done that. that that's, you play to win, right? Now, that, that's going to college. There's all kinds of other, and, and, and I praise the Lord that my children have done that by God's grace. Um, there's uh, raising of children. Uh, Y'all, spank your children. I know I just committed a crime in Canada and probably several northern states. Spank your children. I remember 20 years ago saying, what will it be like to have a generation of children who were not spanked? Well, now we know, right? <laughs> How's that experiment going? But it's more than that. You know, practice family. One thing I do in my church is when you're, before a family is baptizing their first child, I will, I will go with an elder and we'll pay a home visit. We'll just talk to them through the baptismal vows. And we'll just pray with them and talk to them about Christian child raising. One of the things I emphasize is the duty and value of family worship. And, and we kind of work them through. And I, want you, I want them to play to win. There, there's, a, there's things you do. You go, that's legalism. That is not legalism. That's biblical Christianity. You've got to play according to the rules. Y'all, play to win in your lives. Play, if you want to succeed, Paul says, you must play according to the rules. Now, as he's applying this to Christian ministers, this requires an education. Not everyone can attend a lengthy seminary course, but they should if they can. I, I, I always, we have two seminaries nearby, Greenville Seminary and RTS Charlotte, and I always emphasize to them, focus on your studies. Work on your studies. Prepare yourself. Now, there's a, that, this applies to you in your own ways, but th get the education, get the preparation, engage in professional development. Uh, there should be, for, certainly for ministers, there should be internships in the church. Uh, 
Uh, the New Testament emphasizes that the, not only the message, I, th it's, I think this is a hallmark of our generation, we think that biblical fidelity means teaching the biblical message, and it does, but the Bible also teaches methods. It's not, people think, well, the Bible has nothing to say about how you do this. That, that is completely false. The Bible has much to say that is going to be directly relevant about how you do the works given to you you must do these things. You must be devoted to God's word, prayer, biblical worship, and a biblical manner of life. You must play to win. Now, today in America, multitudes of youths devote themselves fanatically, religiously, to developing athletic prowess so that they can have success and adulation and fame and glory. But the Christian competes for a different reward. Paul refers to it as the victor's crown. It's a laurel wreath, that's the metaphor, that a winner at the Olympic Games would get. I mean, he's not, he, he's, he's not speaking of justification through faith alone. He's not talking about something you earn. Uh, justification is by grace through faith alone. But what he's talking about are those gospel achievements that will adorn our profession of faith and will glorify our Lord. These are the crowns that we lay at his feet. In Philippians 4.1, Paul refers to his church, to the converts, as my joy and my crown. Uh, and, and notice that Paul anticipates having a crown to wear uh, uh, and, and to place at the feet of our Lord Jesus. Well, we are to strive loyally for success in the contest. We play according to the rules. The third example is a hardworking farmer who gains the crop only after much diligence. It is the hardworking farmer, verse 6, who ought to have the first share of the crops. Now here we're reminded that Christian service is not always excited. I'm sure you get this. People are like, wow, you're an African missionary. I mean, have you been shot? You know, do you, have you been burned with a tire around your neck? I mean, sadly, no, I'm a slacker. You know, uh, <laughs> what do you do? And then, and, it's, and, what you, and, and then when you tell them, you're thinking, well, what I do is pretty mundane, in fact. I just happen to be doing it in Africa. Well, you're a farmer, and there's routine tasks engaged in farming. Uh, the solitary labor of farming is totally devoid of excitement. It is remote from the glamour of peril and applause. But here the servant of Christ exerts patiently in all seasons, plowing, planting, tending, and then enjoying a harvest. Now we remember Jesus teaching on the parable of the soils, one of the most important parables in the in the. New Testament, in some respects, it's the master parable. And he says, the kingdom of God is like a farmer who went out sowing seed. The seed is the word of God. And, and Christian ministry is that way. It, like farming, it is endless. We do not clock in and clock out. We get up early. We work the field. We care for animals. He shoots the wolves. The farmer is devoted to his work. The chief virtue, he says, is hardworking. I know that is going to be true for you as well. It's hard work to plow the ground. So is prayer. Prayer is hard work. Uh, sowing seed requires skill and attention. So does teaching the Bible. And it requires patient endurance. You're trying to encourage people in the Lord. You're, trying to, you're raising the children in the Rafiki village. It requires patient endurance as you're prayerfully seeking the Lord's work in their life. You have to be vigilant. You're keeping the weeds out. You're trying to keep the false doctrine out of the church. You're trying to avoid perils and temptations. Uh, as we notice, in fact, the close parallels between farming and gospel ministry, we find that Paul's word for hardworking is almost a technical term in other books of the Bible for the ministry. Now, this is true not only for our service in ministry, but also to our pursuit of holiness. J.C. Ryle writes, there are no spiritual gain, pain, gains without pains. He said, I would as soon expect a farmer to prosper in business who contented himself with sowing his fields and never looking at them till harvest as I would expect a believer to attain much holiness who was not diligent about his Bible reading, her prayers, their use of Sundays. This is absolutely true. It, I, I, it's amazing to me. We're living in a time where for this, I've been called a legalist many times for this. And I say, why did you call me a legalist? Because you say we have to obey the Bible. Well, 
Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, my friend. If you love me, you will obey me. And, and there's discipline and hard work, not only in our service of the Lord, but in our spiritual lives, our, our sanctification. But there's compensation, verse 6. The hardworking farmer gets the first share of the crop. Now, the point is that when the harvest comes in, the first person to eat of it is the guy picking it. Is the one who's bringing the yield in. And the, this, is, this is, and I know you experienced this, this is one of the great compensations of Christian ministry. The pastor who prays has his own soul stir, stirred. I will tell you that sermon preparation is a great blessing to me. People say to me, we know you, you have a devotional life, but I hope it's not just your sermon prep. No, but my sermon preparation is very devotional. I'm, uh, very often I stand in the pulpit and I'm thinking, I don't know if you're getting anything out of this, but I sure am. <laughs> you know, really, I, I, I don't. This is great stuff. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what my sermon is, but what I'm preaching is great stuff. I preached the Transfiguration of Jesus yesterday, and I was just even while I'm preaching, I'm going, "This is this is amazing stuff." And I'm, I'm talking about my sermon. I'm talking about Mark's gospel and and Jesus, and it's just you know this vision. I I, I, I was thinking about you know Jesus and the three disciples climbing probably Mount Hermon. It's probably nighttime because Luke said the, the disciples were, of course, asleep. And you think of, you know, the night sky and the, the Pleiades and Ursa Major and Ursa Minor shining above, and then suddenly light bursts out of the mountain and the Shekinah glory. <laughs> I don't know if you're getting anything out of this. I'm getting a lot out of this. Uh, it's one of our great compensations as, we, as, we tell, as you tell others the promises of God. You are reminded of them for yourself. We are, we, let me, I, I hope it's the case, and if you, if you say, I don't know if I'm experiencing it, well, then pray for this, that you would, find, you would be the first beneficiary of the work that you're doing. It's something we ought to aspire to. It's normally the case, I, I think, particularly of your ministry of the children, but the, the, uh, most of your school students are no longer the, 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 the children raised there, but there's these children, the, the Rice students, you're encouraging them. And I know it's not just technical stuff it's discipleship in so many ways i will pray that you would be you'd say you know i got a lot out of that i was really spiritually blessed you ought to be spiritually blessed through your servant we, we have the thrill particularly when someone comes to faith in jesus because it's like i've been a, a midwife at a new birth wow that's, that's amazing well, these are some of the, the, the this, these round out, these rewards round out the incentives that Paul notes. A good soldier longs to please his commanding officer. The athlete trains and runs for the victor's crown. The farmer labors for a harvest that will come with God's blessing. What a thrill it is to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And so whether we're called to the pulpit or to the pew, all Christians play a vital role in reaching out to, uh, to the lost and their sins. I always tell my congregation, the most encouraging words you can say to me after the sermon is, Pastor, I'd like you to meet my neighbor who I brought to church today. And, and, what, you, and what you emphasize, you tend to get. So I tend to get a lot of that. And uh, it's a thrill. Uh, Pastor, I want you to meet my neighbor I brought to church. Oh, I have a deal with Mike. I have a video on my website. I have a deal with you. You bring your neighbor. I promise you I will preach Jesus to them. So... Uh, that's our deal. I think it's a fair deal. Uh, we, play, we, we bear a personal witness to Jesus. We teach the Bible. And we know, we know, we know there will be a harvest. We know the Word of God does not go forth in vain. We know that what's going to result more than justifies our fleeting sacrifice. Now, this is not intended not only to inspire hard work, but particularly perseverance. I, I, I often think about those words in Galatians 6 where Paul again uses the agricultural metaphor. He says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever one sows, that will he also reap. But then he says, let us not grow weary. Let, do, let us not grow weary of doing good, doing what is right. For in due season we will have a harvest. But, that, but he tacks on these words, if we do not give up. Don't give up. You will, it's the promise of the word of God. You will, and maybe, and, and maybe you won't see it, but you'll see it by faith. It, what you're doing in Africa will yield, a, and, and it will happen in ways that are going to be amazing. If you knew now what's going to happen over the next two generations, you would go, I never imagined. Because of our sovereign God and what he will do, let us not grow weary in our service to Christ, for if we will have a harvest, 
unless we give up. Well, church history gives wonderful examples that prove that a faithful, hardworking, and persevering ministry is certain to achieve results. Consider the conversion of Luke Short, who managed to reach the age of 100 without putting his faith in Jesus. But one day, while he was sitting in his New England fields a couple of centuries ago, and Luke Short was reflecting on his long life, he's 100 years old, he was thinking about it all, his mind attached to a sermon he had once heard preached by the famous Puritan John Flavel. And he recalled how Flavel had warned of the horror of dying under God's judgment and curse, and he told how one might be forgiven through the death of Jesus on his behalf. And awakened by hearing that sermon, that remembered sermon, Short called on Jesus for forgiveness, and he was saved. Now, the remarkable thing is that the story, uh, the, the sermon that he remembered was preached 86 years earlier while he was in England. And John Flavel's ministry bore a harvest in one of the people who was there 86 years later. His faithfulness and diligence received a blessing. What an, what an encouragement this is for parents teaching your children God's word, praying for them, evangelizing them, but then missionaries and ministers, let us not give up. Well, briefly, Paul says his final verse, think over what I say, Timothy. Think about it. For the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Uh, we might think that uh, with given the nature of his, uh, his analogies, he'd, be, he'd, be, he'd exhort Timothy about his legs or his backs or his arms, he says, no, the most important organ is your mind. Think it over, Timothy. And he wants us to think about what he said about the challenges facing us in serving Christ. It, are we tempted to self-pity when our labors are opposed? The answer is, yes, we are. Uh, we should remember then that we are called as soldiers onto a battlefield. We should not be self-pitying given that service. Are we tempted to take a shortcut and, and then do what's trendy and popular will get us earthly appraise. Well, let us remember that an athlete is crowned by keep playing according to the rules. Do we become tired? Are we just worn out? And we just want to give up the charge? Remember, though, you're a, you're a farmer, and you are laboring to a harvest that has not yet come. It requires long perseverance, and there will be a crop. And Paul says, Timothy, if you think about these things, he's confident the Lord will give you understanding in all things. Above all, the servant of Christ should remember the enormous blessings that result from our gospel service. Faithfulness in the gospel will yield a harvest that by God's power will exceed all our expectations and will bring glory to God for all eternity. And Paul's endurance in ministry is going to enable him to say these words at the end of 2 Timothy, I have fought the good fight. See, he's, his same, same metaphors applied to him. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And the, the stupendous blessing is a great privilege that we get to do all these things for Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord Jesus Christ, who will tell us, well done, thou good and faithful service. Bill Barclay says, the Christian can be certain that after the effort of the Christian life, there comes the joy of heaven. The greater the struggle now, the greater the joy will be then. Well, finally, if we think over Paul's idea of Christian ministry, we'll realize the same inspiring truth that motivates soldiers to advance bravely into battle, namely this, we serve a commander who leads from the front. He leads from the front. Like any good leader, Jesus does not ask us to embrace any pains that he has not far more endured on our behalf. With this in mind, I think a fitting conclusion is that exhortation in 1 Peter 2, 21-24. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sins and live to righteousness. 
By his wounds have you been healed. Father, we thank you for Jesus. And Father, it's not easy serving him. And I know that being a Rafiki missionary is certainly not easy. Uh, but Father, it, Jesus did go before us. He does lead from the front. And we have the great privilege of serving him because he is Lord. And I pray that everyone here today would remember Christ exalted in heaven, reigning over all things, returning soon, the glory of his kingdom soon to be seen and experienced by us. Uh, Father, we are often tired. We are often weary and frustrated, just run down. So we pray that your Holy Spirit would give us refreshment through your word. And I pray for these dear men and women that they would not feel harangued by your word, but rather inspired and refreshed because it's true. And the promises will come true. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.